Good morning. Good morning. Ooh, that was great. <laughs> Welcome to Rock Island First Church of the Nazarene. Glad that you are here this morning. And we're looking forward to a great day in the Lord. And trust that as uh, you participate in the worship service this morning, you will feel and sense the power and presence of God in your life. Uh, and that as uh, Alan... Actually, what we want you to do is walk out of here a different person than what you came in. That's all we need to. That's all we're looking for is transformation. That's all. That's all we're looking for. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not thank you. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. Our God, you reign forever. Three. 
Veil sun, disaster comes. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul. When waters rise and hope takes flight, oh, my soul, oh.
Let's pray, shall we? Oh God, our heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth and the reality of what we have been saying and singing this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your persistence. We thank you, Lord, for your greatness and goodness. We thank you for your majestic holiness and that you give us an opportunity to share in that holiness and in that love. Lord, we come to you this morning truly with hearts overflowing. And we thank you and praise you for the presence and ministry of your Holy Spirit among us today. Lord, we thank you for <clears throat> watching over us throughout this past week. We thank you for meeting our every need, even if and when we were not aware of it and conscious of it. We thank you for loving us. We thank you, Lord, for forgiving us when we were lost or when we have strayed. We thank you for the power of God that is at work in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, what we said earlier about transformation, that is our goal, that is our desire, that Lord, today we would not walk out the same as when we walked in, but that our hope, our faith, our trust, our confidence in you would be renewed. And those situations in our lives that are perplexing would be placed into, uh, into context. And Lord, that we might continue to draw strength and newness of life from your hand. But Lord, we also understand and recognize that as we come to you this morning, we come very needy. Needing a touch from God needing to hear from heaven, needing to sense your power and your presence once again. Father, we come to you today also on behalf of those that are sick and those that are, that are um, recovering from surgeries and procedures. God, we pray that your power and presence and your healing strength would be among them and that you would be in them and at work in them. Father, we come also on behalf of a community, our community, wherever we live. We pray, O oh God, for our neighbors today. We think of those that are on the left of us, of those that are on the right, those that perhaps are across the way, those that live behind us, those that are easy to get along with and those that are difficult. Father, help us in the midst of all those circumstances and situations to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ in our, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. And Lord, help us to reach out the hand of Christ in love to those that need your touch whether it's in their bodies, whether it's in their hearts, whether it's in their spirits. Lord, help us truly to be your people. Help us to be your body. And Lord, we come in behalf of, uh, of our world, our broken world in so many ways. And Lord, we pray that you'd lead us your church. Lord, as we continue to think of and prepare to take the, the Jesus film to Guatemala in February, God, we pray that even now you would begin preparing not only our hearts, but the hearts of the people in that city where we will be in ministry. We pray for those that are involved in the, in the planning and in the logistics of that trip, both in, in, uh, in Guatemala and in... And Lord, we just pray for your guidance and your leadership and your wisdom. Lord, thank you again today for meeting our every need. Thank you for pouring out of your spirit upon us. And thank you, Lord, for the, for the way that you take care of us uh, 
physically and financially. And Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you today for that. And Lord, give back to you once again just a small portion of what you have given to us in tithes and offerings. And we will praise you forever, for you indeed are very good. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. It is good to be together today, isn't it? Praise his wonderful name. I want to uh, uh, just mention to you that uh, for the next uh, couple of Sundays, Lee Baker is going to be preaching. Dee and I are going to leave on vacation on uh, Thursday and uh, <clears throat> going to ultimately end up in northern Michigan for a few days and then go back to uh, my high school class reunion and get to see how old those people are and how much they have changed in my youthfulness. Uh, it'll be fun. It's always, it's always a good time. And so this is uh, actually the last Sunday I will be preaching from the, uh, <clears throat> from the Articles of Faith. Lee is going to uh, finish up the, uh, the last two that uh, are generally called the Doctrine of Last Things, uh, the Return of Christ and uh, Eternal uh, Life, Destiny, and Judgment, and, and uh, some of those things. So uh, it, will be, uh, it will be a good couple of Sundays. God will, God will bless. Well, last week, as I was thinking about this week's message, I got to thinking about divine healing. And that's what I'm speaking about today. Why is it that divine healing is an article of faith? It's not for everybody. But for us, it is an article of our faith. It is one of the foundational things that we believe. Now, I could readily understand uh, the Trinity, having an article of faith on the Trinity, of what we believe about the Father, Son, and Spirit, and their relationship, and their work in the world, and the atonement, you know, how it is that we come to, uh, to righteousness, how it is we come to faith in Christ, salvation, sanctification, entire sanctification, what we believe are true sacraments, and, and the doctrine of last things, but healing. Why is it that our early leaders put in our Constitution divine healing? But nevertheless, it's there, and it's rightly so. Now, the other articles of faith speak about what God has done and what God's... But Articles 9 and 10 and, and particularly 14 deal with God as how God is acting now. 9 and 10 has to do with, uh, with uh, uh, justification and redemption and, and adoption. And, and number 10 is with entire sanctification, what God wants to do in people's lives right now, what He is doing in people's lives. But also, Article 14. It's a reminder that God is one who is active in and among His creation. Now, contrary to, uh, to, to the deists, who teach that once that everything was in place, God just kind of cast it out there, His universe, His, his, uh, uh, his, his creation. Uh, he just kind of cast it out there, and, and it's, it's physical and, and spiritual laws were all put in place, and He just kind of sat back and watched and doesn't really have anything to do with what's going on in our lives. God just abandon it. We believe as Christians that God is present and accounted for and He is busy in His world. He is not just sipping iced tea and if He's in the south it's sweet tea. He's not just watching it all as it unfolds or sometimes as it comes to rack and ruin. No, He's active on so many different levels. And then there, there are the reformers, like Martin Luther and, and, and John Calvin and, and, and Zwingli and so on. Their, and their reaction against what they saw as, as superstition and abuse that they saw in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, they, they, regarding healing and all things miraculous, they just kind of passed this whole notion of healing by. And in fact, they almost 
pretty much said that it doesn't really happen. The, the, this matter of divine healing closed when the New Testament closed. It was just for that particular time. But we believe that God still reaches into time and space and He messes around with elements and, and molecules and tissue and fibers to relieve the suffering and the pain and extend the earthly existence of some people. Now, I've got to be honest. I, uh, I approach this subject with a sense of nervousness. Divine healing. My nervousness comes from that word, some. Because, you see, everybody who comes to faith and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Isn't that something? Everybody. No matter what background, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter what, everybody that comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and allows Him to forgive their sins and to transform, to regenerate their lives and to adopt Him into His, his family, everybody will be saved. I mean, there's, there's no question. It's like, here it is. You got it. And everybody, those who have come to faith in Christ, and everyone who will commit and consecrate and totally yield themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in their lives, will be able to, will be filled with the Holy Spirit, will be sanctified, will be cleansed, and made whole. Everybody, everybody that says, Lord Jesus, now I not only want to give you my sins, I want to give you my life. He will receive it, and He will use it however He wants to. But not everyone for whom we offer the prayer for healing, even after anointing them with oil, will receive the healing for which they're asking. And that's the mystery. And that's the dilemma. Shortly after I moved, within a few months, after I moved to uh, the church where I pastored in Washington, Illinois, in Sunnyland, there was a woman who was dying of cancer. Everybody knew she was dying of cancer. And she would be in and out of the hospital, and we'd go visit and pray and talk to her. But there was one individual in our church who said, I know God told me that he is going to heal this woman. And I remember walking across many times the parking lot at Methodist Hospital in Peoria where she was confined as a patient from time to time. Saying, Lord, I don't get this. I don't understand. And the same woman that said, God, and I mean, she, you know, in her hospital room, in her face, God said, you're going to rise up out of that bed. Also, also the same woman that said, God is going to come on us in such a way that we're going to walk up to people in the, house, in, 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 the, in the grocery store and we're just going to touch them and they're going to be made well. So that's my dilemma. That's why there's a sense of anxiety that goes along with preaching about divine healing. However, with a sense of uh, resolve and reticence, here we go. Article 14. It says, We believe in the Bible doctrine of divine healing and urge our people to seek to offer the prayer of faith for the healing of the sick. We also believe God heals through the means of medical science. And then there are also in the, in the, the, the manual and the doctrine, the articles of faith, there are supporting scriptures that... Uh, are listed and uh, you're not going to have to write all those down because we're going to quote some of them as we go along here in just a moment uh, 
Because one of the things I'm doing through this series is show, trying to encourage you and remind you and show you that we're just not making this stuff up, that it's in the Bible. So let's take a look at the, at the first one that we want to read together. It's Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. And let's go. It's Psalm of David. Everybody, praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And then there's... Uh, in the New Testament, there is Matthew, chapter 4, verses uh, 23 and 24. Let's take a look at it. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. In Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 16, we see the disciples, or we see the apostles' uh, ministry of healing, uh, at least one example of it. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. And then in James, chapter, four, uh, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, we read these words about divine healing. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be helped. The prayer of righteous man is powerful and effective. All right. Let's break this down. We believe in the Bible doctrine of divine healing. The Bible is filled with experiences in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament of divine healing, where God came through. One of the passages of Scripture that is, uh, is, is a part of this uh, article of faith is from 2 Kings chapter, nine, chapter 5, where uh, Naaman, who is a Syrian general, he's not even a... He's not even an Israelite. He's a Syrian general, has got leprosy, and he comes to, he comes to Elisha, uh, the prophet, and, he's, and, and he wants to be healed of his leprosy. And so Elisha says, okay, here's what you do. You go down and you, and you dip yourself seven times into the Jordan River. And, and the, the, at first, uh, Naaman was kind of incensed at that. He said, well, isn't, aren't the rivers back home good enough for me to dip into? But nevertheless, his uh, soldiers and his, his attendants um, uh, helped him to see that, you know, maybe you just, maybe just need to go ahead and do this. And, sit, and he was healed. There are times and in instances in the, uh, uh, in the Old Testament uh, among the prophets that, uh, that there were people that were raised from the dead. Moses accomplished all kinds of miraculous things as well as healings. When the people were in November, uh, November Numbers 21st chapter, uh, when the people were um, experiencing uh, death, really, uh, bites by vipers because of their sin. 
Moses uh, fashioned a, a snake out of, uh, of gold and put it on a or, or brass and put it on a stake and, and set it up in the middle of the camp. And everybody that looked at that would be healed from that snake bite. And, of course, Jesus' ministry is full of healings. Now, when you read through the Gospels, a lot of them are repeated, but there are 17 different instances uh, that are just recorded of Jesus healing people. Sometimes he did it from a distance. Sometimes he would just tell the person who came on behalf of the other person, saying, uh, my, my, my child or my servant needs healing. He would say, go home, your, per- your, your servant as well. On other times, he would spit on the ground and he'd pick up some of the mud and he'd work it around in his, in his palm of his hand a little bit and smear it on the person's eyes and they were and, and, and told him to go wash. Other times he would, do, he would do a different variety of things. But ministry, the ministry of healing and, and just what we read this morning in Matthew. I mean, by the hundreds they brought people to him. And probably by the thousands. And he would... Sometimes he would sit in the courtyard of a house and it would just be a, a, a line that would go through. And if you know folks from the Middle East, it wasn't a very orderly line either. They were just coming after him. And of course, in the apostles' ministry, the experiences of the apostles, uh, different times where, where God healed people in a miraculous way. Thing is often done in, with the forgiving of sins. In fact, in, in, in uh, Mark chapter 2, where the four friends brought the man on the, on the pallet and they made a hole in the roof and they let the man down, Jesus, the first thing Jesus said to him was, your sins are forgiven. Now, on the surface, we would look at it and say, you know, he didn't come to have his sins forgiven, he came to be healed. But he also needed to have his sins forgiven. And so it was all part of it. It's a, there's a very close connection between the, 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 the forgiving of sins. In James chapter 5, which we read uh, every time that we anoint people with oil for healing. Uh, and if there are sins, they will be forgiven. And so there's a connection between, uh, there, there's a connection between faith for healing and faith for the forgiveness of sins. Tom Fry, pastor at the uh, Escondido, California, Church of the Nazarene, says this. God is the ultimate healer. He passed authority to Jesus, and he has charged the Holy Spirit to anoint people with the spiritual gift of healing. But we are all merely vessels in touch of God. And there's no indication that God ever intended not to heal people directly. There's no indication that God did not continue to intend when the when when the when the first generations of Christians were 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 dead and were gone, there was no intention of God to say, well, okay, we're done with the divine healing right now. I think we're going to move on to something else. It's still there. And so we believe in this. We believe in this. This is who we are. This is what we say. This is how we act. And the article goes on to say, and we urge our people to seek to offer the prayer of faith for the healing of the sick. You see, this is the central part. This is the central part of the article of faith. It's something that we do. It is an exhortation to pray. We believe in the Bible doctrine of divine healing and people to seek to offer the prayer of faith for the healing of the sick. Something that we are to do. You know, prayer opens the door for the healing power of God to be at work. Prayer opens the door for God to be at work in any, in any way. And that's how we communicate. That's how we fellowship with God. That's how we, that's how we participate in His kingdom is through prayer. And so he calls upon us to pray. And it opens the door for the healing power of God to work. And one writer said, I really love the way this is said, it is always right to ask God for what we want. In faith and in trust. It is always 
right to ask God for what we want. Jesus echoed that over and over again in the, in the various, uh, various uh, some of the parables, some of the stories that he told, the, the persistent widow who kept coming to the judge and saying, you know, make my case right, do what, do what you're supposed to do. And, and Jesus likened that to say, hey, let, let's, we need to keep going to our Father in that way. And different times, in different ways. The parable of the, of the neighbor who comes, to the, who, who comes to your house at night banging on the door and says, hey, I got a last-minute visitor, I got, I, and I'm out of bread, I need a loaf of bread, and, and you're in your house all set with your kids and, and, every, and everything else, and you say, well, I, I can't. My, my kids are in bed with me, and I can't, I can't go. I can't come to help you. And Jesus said, that's a little bit how like prayer is. And he says, the man, the man gets up out of his bed and goes, takes him a loaf of bread, not because he wants to help him, but because he won't quit knocking on the door. Because of his persistence. It is always right to ask God for what we desire and what we want. Much like children asking their parents. <clears throat> Another thing is that, it, that it's always better to intercede for someone else than to ask them to pray for themselves. Oh, you got a problem? Pray for yourself. We never say that, do we? You got a problem? I will pray for you. And then we do, unless we forget. But that's a whole other sermon. It's better for us to intercede for somebody than say, oh, well, you know, go, go take care of yourself. Go pray, pray about it yourself. We pray for that person in response to what we say that we do. We urge our people to seek to offer the prayer of faith for the healing of the sick. The prayer of faith participates in the ministry of Jesus. Do you realize that? When we are praying for the healing of someone else, we are participating in the ministry of of Jesus. Jesus is working along in us and through us and with us. Nearly every reference to Jesus' healing, it says he was either moved uh, towards compassion or he felt compassion towards them and uh, towards those who were sick. Nearly every reference, there was compassion. And you know, there's a great satisfaction in being a participant when the Lord heals somebody and uses you to help. A number of years ago when we came here, uh, a friend of Eva Moore down in Kentucky had discovered that she had a tumor on her lung. And they were just about completely certain it was lung cancer. And I guess we'd been here about a year, and so she asked if I would go. We, we were in, in revival. And she asked if I would go call this lady and pray for her. So, so Eva Moore, and I think my wife, and the evangelist, Howard Love, and Eva all gathered around my, my, my speakerphone in my office on my desk. And so we dialed the lady's number, and, and she answered the phone down in Kentucky, and, and, uh, and we talked a little bit, and so we said, so it's okay, this is what we're going to do. You know, Eva has asked us to come and pray for you. I mean, she was several hundred miles away. And so we prayed. I prayed, and Eva prayed, and everybody prayed just that God would intervene on this, on this lady's life and would bring healing from this cancer. And so we hung up the phone, went home, did what we normally do. A few days later, got a telephone call from Eva. She said, guess what? My friend down in Kentucky that we prayed for the other night, yeah, that tumor is gone. It's absolutely gone. There's nothing there. And you know how humbling that is and how wonderful that is to be a part of somebody, someone that God uses to touch somebody else's life. What a blessing it is. What an encouragement. What a, what a strengthening it is. What a, a moment of satisfaction. And so through prayer, we're asking God to, to act 
in behalf of those of somebody that's in a prison of pain. Calvin Miller talks about sickness as, as a prison of pain. And we are part of breaking that person free. Prayer enhances our faith. And faith is what opens the door for healing. Prayer increases our faith. It enhances it. And it's an essential ingredient to healing. And oftentimes, most oftentimes, when we are able to, prayer is to be accompanied by anointing with oil. Oil is that symbol. Just like, just like the water of baptism is a symbol of, of, uh, of new life in Christ, just as uh, the communion elements are symbols of the body and blood of Christ, so oil is, is, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit and the healing power that comes through the Holy Spirit and comes through the Word of God and comes through what He desires us to do. And so we urge our people to seek to offer the prayer of faith for the healing of the sick. And then we also believe... God heals through the means of medical science. We've never advocated those who seek healing to throw away the providential means by which they are in the process of being treated. The means of healing that have come through medical research. Calvin Miller, in his book, uh, in his, in, in his book Miracles and Wonders, he says... This statement says, pray about any illness you have, but when your prayer is finished, rise from your knees and call a doctor. And I know that faith and, and science and research and Christianity have kind of had this love-hate relationship uh, over the centuries and over time. And one accuses the other of all kinds of different things. But listen, the creative and the curious mind that God has given to humanity is a gift. And part, we are grateful for those that use it. We are grateful for those that use it. Think just, you know, just as you think about people that you have known and the amazing advances in medicine and science that have been used to treat them, ultimately that comes from our Heavenly Father. So here's some one-liners. Praying for the sick to be God who acts. We're coming to Him and saying, God, act in behalf of this person. Divine healing is the convergence of God's sovereignty, His grace, and our faith. And therein lies the mystery. And I cannot explain it. Most of the time I don't try to explain it. I just say that's what it is. Divine healing is the convergence of God's sovereignty. Everything is subject to the sovereignty of God. Everything that we receive from Him is as a result of His grace and His goodness. And everything that He does in us is in response to our faith. And, when the, and where and however those three come together, we find healing. The next one is pray for everyone's healing. Rejoice with those who are healed and seek God's grace on behalf of those who aren't. Pray for God's healing every time, all the way through. And for those that are, rejoice. A number of, probably a little over a year ago, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, I'm not sure exactly when it was, our news district superintendent, Scott Sherwood, his mother was, uh, was diagnosed with cancer. And it, it was like stage four, it was terminal, and there was no getting around it. One Sunday morning in a worship service, uh, a pastor from Africa was there. And, and she just felt impressed uh, to, to pray specifically in a certain way for Bonnie Sherwood. And she prayed, and, and somewhere one night in the middle of the night, Bonnie says she, and I can't tell the story like the Sherwoods can tell it, but, but because it happened to them. But she woke up the night, and she, and, and, and she said this, there was the strangest sensation going through her body. 
And she was absolutely declared cancer free. And so we pray for everybody's healing and we rejoice. I mean, I mean they were bouncing off the walls with excitement and joy and blessing. But seek God's grace also for those who aren't. When we have a uh, when we experience God's divine healing, then we have an obligation to serve. What are we gonna do with it? What are we going to do with this new lease on life? What are we going to do with this new, new uh, moment of health and hopefulness? What am, I, am I just going to squander it on myself? Am I just going to say, oh, this is wonderful. Look what God did. No. It's an obligation to serve. That comes from Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus and the disciples came home one from, from the synagogue one Sabbath day and found that, mother, that Peter's mother-in-law was sick of a fever in bed. And so Peter went in, or Jesus rather, went in and spoke to her and, and touched her and, and miraculously healed her. And what did she do? She got up and gave them lunch. There's an obligation to serve when God does something with it. We just don't absorb it. Because you see what happens when we absorb it? It just gets rotten. And it begins to stink. And then finally, if you've never experienced divine healing, be, be grateful that you have not needed it. You know, sometimes we look at miracles and we look at healings and we say, oh man, wouldn't it be great to experience? Do you know what you have to go through to experience divine healing? You grow through sickness. You go through uncertainty. You go through pain. You go through you, you go through all kinds of things. So, I just threw that one in. If you've never experienced it, don't feel bad. Because that means you haven't needed it. I want to close this morning with a story. Not about healing necessarily, but a story about grace. My wife's dad, A.E. McFarland, was born in 1917. As a boy, he worked with his dad on the, uh, fa the family sawmill up in, up in kind of the middle part of Michigan, kind of right there. Only state in the Union you can do that. And if you live in the Upper Peninsula, right there. He also, as he grew older, he, he began to work in the oil fields in, in that same area. Went to a short stint in the, in the uh, Navy at the end of World War II. Ultimately, he came out of that and ultimately responded to the call to preach and spent his life in ministry for 40 years in the Church of the Nazarene. He married his first wife, Faye, as a very young man. And Faye died less than a year after they were married of complications from an abscessed tooth. This was back in the 30s. Not too long after that, he married Faye's adopted sister Eleanor with whom he was to whom he was married for 37 years with whom he had eight children my wife was one of them in 1969 it was discovered that uh, Eleanor had Hodgkin's disease and through multiple rounds of radiation and chemotherapy she fought the disease until she died in 1975 in October Two years later, at age 60, Mac, as he was called, was diagnosed with a strange condition known as Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. It's a neurological disorder, kind of in, in the muscular dystrophy family. CMT begins with, uh, with neuropathy, which is numbness in the, in the lower extremities, and it, and, it, and it works its way up, and, and then it gets into your fingers, and it kind of works its way up your arms until eventually it causes balance problems and mobility problems. For some reason, there is a, there is a, a connection between that and a, and a heightened sense of anxiety. Matt got to the point, of course, he was in his early 80s, but he got to the point, he said, uh, you know what? He said, I just, I just he, would, he would preach sitting on a stool. He wasn't pastoring a church, but he would be called to fill in places. And he said, but, but I got to the point where, where even that, he said, I, I just... He just, I would just forget everything. 
And so he finally got to the place where he just could not preach any longer. But I mean, his mind was still sharp. He was quick-witted. He always had a joke. In his later years, some of them weren't always appropriate, but they were always funny. (laughs) I won't tell you. But this condition, the Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease, is, is a genetic uh, condition that is passed down from generation. Four of Mac's five daughters have that condition, including my wife. And the fifth one won't get diagnosed, but she shows all the symptoms. And in every one of these instances, throughout all these decades, as these circumstances and these situations occurred, Mac and his family frequently heeded the call to offer the prayer of faith for the healing of the sick and anointing with oil. Multiple times. Multiple times. The CMT was especially perplexing to Mac. And most of the time, he, he maintained a positive outlook and would even joke about it sometimes. He would say, yeah, he says, well, when the numbness, numbness uh, when the neuropathy gets to my head, I'll be a numbskull. But there are other times that he railed against that disease. He railed against the fact that it had sapped the strength and the feeling and the usefulness of his legs and his arms, even his facial features towards the end. And uh, he would rail against this, this thing that had taken him from a Six foot five, two hundred and fifty pound, robust, do it all kind of guy. Had the hands the size of a baseball mitt, and turn him into a wheelchair bound and walker bound invalid. That was what he was facing. That's what he lived with. He would cry out to God. He would question his faith. He would watch preachers on TV. He would, he would remind God that he had served him as, as a pastor in the ministry for, for over 40, close to 50 years in different capacities. The healing he longed for never came. But in the midst of these decades of grief and loss and disease, His faith in Christ still held true. He would give honor and praise to the Lord. Sometimes with a catch in his voice, as we would go visit him from time to time, he would talk about how blessed he was, even though he couldn't move that much anymore. He would talk about he and his third wife. they, they, They were married for 34 years. And he would talk about how they would laugh and how they would have fun and how they would just... All kinds of things. They would laugh at each other. And they, would, they would just enjoy, and the, enjoy the blessings and the, and the presence of the Lord and, and the love that He had found with them. He would, he would testify to anybody that would listen about the love of God and the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. Anybody that came along, He would talk to them. Everybody that, that came near sensed the love and presence of God. I remember going to their home. They lived in a trailer uh, Mobile home, excuse me. They don't live in trailers anymore. They live in mobile homes. And just going there and just being renewed in my own faith, in my own trust in Jesus Christ. And in the midst of all that, in spite of the lack of divine healing, Mac understood that heaven is the, is the finest and most final of Christian miracles. And so today, in keeping with our belief and acting on our faith, we are going to offer, pray the prayer of healing for all who want to be anointed and prayed for. A couple weeks ago, we baptized four people. 
last week by participating in the Lord's Supper. And because as I was working through this series of messages, I thought, oh man, if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about it, we better do it. And so today, in just a few moments, I want to give you an opportunity to be anointed and to be prayed for and ask God for some miracles, some healing. God asked us to pray, and that's what we're going to do. I've got some elders that are going to come and take your places, if you will. Lee and Larry and Mike and Ken. Seth, would you bring? go ahead and bring the praise team up? And we just want to invite you this morning. What we're going to ask you to do is that if you have a desire to be anointed... If you just come and, and these men will be at the uh, in in the uh, right at the bottom of the stairs uh, with with oil, we'll just ask you to come and to, to stand and to allow them to pray for you and to anoint you with oil. Now, if you come and you can't stand, uh, feel free to sit down on the on the uh, on the seat there on the front uh, front seat. Um, but we just want to we just want to invite the people of God. Come and say, you know what? I need God's touch in my life. And the praise team is going to lead us in a song. But let's just pray a word before we begin. Lord Jesus, today we come into your presence and we thank you for the gift of divine healing. Obedience to you today and to your word it says if anyone is sick among you, that the elders of the church anoint them with oil and pray for them. They will be healed. Now, Lord, I don't understand all of that. But we are responding and acting in obedience to you today as we come forward to seek your healing touch upon our needs, upon our body, mind, and spirit. And Lord, if there is need for confession of sin today, give us grace that in the process of asking you for healing, that we might ask you for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Come, those that desire to be anointed, be prayed over. Please come.
Jepir. Amin.